mister editorial we must foster intellectual growth more effort should be put into filling the gap created by the killing of intellectuals in 1971 we join the nation in paying our heartfelt tribute to the intellectuals who were systematically killed near the end of the liberation war in 1971 in in what was a clear attempt to intellectually cripple the newly emerging country <clears throat> we must say that even after 51 years since those dark days the void created by the heinous actions of the pakistani army and their collaborators has yet to be filled the killings which followed a careful selection of talented civilians from different professions that formed the intellectual bedrock of the nation have left a deep mark on our collective psyche and they will be missed forever those who were targeted as part of this conspiracy were well known and well respected figures res- representing various fields such as arts education literature science medicine and so on and could have contributed hugely to the development of the new country they were one can say some of the greatest assets of this country at that point in our history the enemy clearly wanted to dis- destabilize destabilize the country and impede its future progress even before it was born and we continue to bear that burden even to this day in this connection it should be mentioned that even after all these years bangladesh is still uh, does not have a completed list of those who were killed we are still in the dark about the exact number of murdered intellectuals this is very unfortunate we call upon the government to step up and complete the list at the earliest possible time so that people can know about all those who sacrificed their lives for us we also urge the authorities and relevant stakeholders to take steps to foster the development of new intellectuals in the country including through creating a proper environment for intellectual exercises ensuring academic freedom and making proper investment in education and research they should also undertake programs and scholarships that may help young bangladeshi scholars to thrive and prosper intellectuals of this land were historically recognized for their influence but today for regions stated above as well as the overall socio political environment at present our intellectual contribution seems to have gone down significantly currently conditions that might foster intellectual growth are being stifled as the atmosphere for free critical thought is absent <coughs> as such we do not have many intellectuals to depend on to guide us through these times other than a few examples of scholars in some specific fields at home or abroad much of our intellectual realm still remains empty we must address this we must foster an environment in which intellect can thrive because without doing so we may never fill the gap that the pakistanis had left us with in 1971 we must not let their vicious plan become a permanent reality for us
Why do NBR reserves reservoirs keep getting breached? After the latest breach, it should be seen as a potential national security issue. The release of at least three consign consignments without inspection from Chattogram port using the login credentials of a top customs official in June to July. Despite the recent measures taken to prevent such frauds from re re reoccurring is an alarming development. Not only does it cost the state of coffers in unpaid duties and taxes, but it also raises a number of national security concerns that consignments are being allowed into the country without inspection raises the obvious question as to what their contents were. Even though the consignments were not supposed to contain illegal items, as per the documents in the National Board of Revenue Server, the, the fact that they were released without any inspection and that the NBR server was breached to release them means that such possibilities cannot be ruled out. According to customs officials investigating the case, the ID of an additional commissioner of Chattogram Custom was used to unlock the suspended business identification number of EA, then Textile Corporation, located in Kumilla Export Processing Zone, which was locked on March 1 by the Chattogram Customs Bond Commissionerate for evading duties and taxes amounting to Taka 8.6 crore and misusing the bond facility. A locked BIN means the company is barred from export-import activities. So, the fact that consignments of a BIN locked company have been released for the first time without any kind of supervision or inspection is a matter that demands serious investigation. Even though the consignments were not supposed to contain illegal items as per the documents in the National Board of Revenue server, the fact that they were released without any inspection and that the NVR server was breached to release them means that such possibilities cannot be ruled out. What is now new, however, is the use of a custom official's login credentials for the NVR server to release imported goods illegally. Last year, at least 21 import consignments were released unlawfully using the IDs of at least seven revenue officials. Investigators at the time blamed the breach on a cyber criminal gang, but so far they have been unable to identify the gang and its members. According to one customs officer, the accused remained unidentified in the previous incidents due to incomplete investigation and not taking punitive measures against the culprits. Why the authorities failed to properly complete the investigation is anyone's gaze. But we must ask, how did such a breach take place again even after the NBR apparently took a number of measures last December to prevent the re reoccurrence uh, of such incidents? Moreover, on June 29, customs officials assigned to do a physical examination of the consignments in question reportedly gave clearance even though the submitted documents contained false bank documents and import permit from the Bangladesh Export Processing Zone Authority. Why was this allowed to happen? Clearly, there are a number of questions and issues that are yet to be resolved. But one thing is for sure, the facts
the facts on the ground that raise such questions are extremely inconcerning the authorities need to unearth the truth of what happened in conclusive investigations that roll on for months if not years are not what we need and because of this sensitivity and nature of the case it is urgent that the authorities involve independent experts who can unbiasedly look into what really happened open space is an asset use it wisely city fathers must commit to meeting Uh, the recreational needs of residents it is disconcerting concerning how the few open spaces left in our cities are always at the risk of being encroached polluted or repurposed by the authorities perhaps by perhaps more frustrating is when an attempt is made to make them suitable for a recreational purpose only to be rendered unusable because of neglect one recent example of this as reported by the by this daily is the shek rasel park near the jatrabari intersection which one year into its reopening following renovation has been largely taken over by makeshift shops and antisocial elements the the renovation which began in 2017 was meant to make the park a suitable space where residents could retreat to for fresh air but in the absence of supervision and maintenance from dhaka south city corporation it is being increasingly used by makeshift shops drug peddlers and criminal gangs making it hard for its intended beneficiaries to spend quality time there stench from public urination is also an issue as there is no public toilet when asked an executive engineer of dscc region 5 said the situation will improve once the park is leased out to a third party the question is why hasn't it happened yet despite the awful state of such a vital public property why is nothing being done to free it of unwanted elements This is unfortunately a common scenario in what few parks are available in the country. The Golakmoni Shishu Park in Khulna city uh, for instance is reported to have no rides for children despite what its name suggests and despite having been established decades ago in 1984. instead it is crowded by small shops and offices of political parties besides serving as a sitting sitting area for pharmacy representatives who frequent uh, the diabetic hospital nearby in the same city another park mojuni shishu park remains closed for 4 years in the name of renovation the promise of modernization made by the city authorities proving empty by the day this too uh, we are told is because of the absence of a lease lizi reportedly none of the eight parks under the khulna city corporation has recreational facilities for children <coughs> that city authorities in our country 
are most neglectful of the refreshment needs of residents is glaringly obvious otherwise why are there such lengthy delays in finding leases to maintain parks <coughs> why would they be closed when they should be open to visitors given how widespread this problem has been why aren't city corporations running the park themselves uh, in the absence of leases it's a sorry waste of public funds and spaces when parks are left to in encroachers or lock locked up we would like to see our city fathers not only to inaugurate parks but also ensure citizens are able to use them every day without any hindrances of any sort given the rapid urbanization in the country having open functional park is no is more vital than ever how we approach criticism can make a huge difference we wholeheartedly support the prime minister's stance of not bowing to any external pressure in running the affairs of the country as a sovereign nation this is the only way to conduct our business under no circumstances can our sovereignty and national security be compromised that said the foreign minister and his deputy as well as the law minister who conveyed the pm's message at a seminar attended by several western ambassadors didn't elaborate on the kind of pressure bangladesh likely faced apart from hinting at a handful of countries from the north and warning that there are red lines that cannot be crossed but there is a clear back story to their announcement coming as it does shortly after a joint statement issued by 15 foreign missions where they called for peaceful assembly and a free fair and inclusive electoral process in bangladesh in november the japanese ambassador had caused a stir by city citing alleged incidents of ballot stuffing in the 2018 election adding that he would never heard of this happening anywhere else clearly the government didn't take kindly to such comments and felt the need to reiterate its stance on the next election and the human rights situation including allegations of enforced disappearances just as international phrase helps to enhance our global standing our critical reaction to international security can harm that standing too to accept phrase and reject scrutiny is a choice not available to countries like ours which can only thrive through cooperation and not being in isolation the recent remarks by other ruling party leaders also suggested growing discomfort at what they view as interference from foreign diplomats in our internal affairs However, we want to raise the question as to what constitutes interference. We are not oblivious to the diplomatic norms that govern state-to-state -state relations and the role of diplomatic missions in host countries. But as part of an interconnected global order, Bangladesh cannot dismiss of hand genuine concerns of our global partners especially when it is endeavoring 
to strengthen ties with some of the very foreign missions involved. Among them are the EU and the US, from which Bangladesh is seeking preferential trade terms to expand its exports and prepare for a post-LDC reality. Bangladesh considers them as partners on trade, security and other issues. So why can it not do so on issues like human rights, labor rights, etc. Some of the issues they have flagged we must acknowledge are long-standing problems that we in the media have repeatedly highlighted the concerns over democratic practice including shrinking space for the opposition and electoral irregularities are l legitimate. Equally significant are concerns over Bangladesh law like the Digital Security Act as well as barriers to freedom of speech and press freedom. As a signatory to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and many other international treaties, it is only expected that Bangladesh will live up to scrutiny from the international community. The question is how Bangladesh should conduct its own affairs in a globalized environment in which mutual cooperation and mutual dependence are two inseparable parts of the same reality. Just as international phrase helps to enhance our global standing, our critical reaction to international scrutiny can harm that standing too. To accept phrase and reject scrutiny is a choice not available to countries like ours, which can only thrive through cooperation and not being in isolation. The quicker we realize this reality, the better for us. RHD must not delay crucial projects. It must explain why estimated cost of a project should up even before its takeoff. We are disappointed about the developments surrounding the planet Banga Joshua Benapol road expansion project to be implemented by the Roads and Highways Department. The project promises to enhance connectivity in the region through the Padda Bridge and Modumoti Bridge. However, is reported by the Daily Star. Even before its estimated cost has been approved, it was revised to show a 25% increase, a roughly taka 2800 crore. For context, this amount alone exceeds the annual budget for RHD's road maintenance works in fiscal year 2021 to 2022. This is but an example of how poor planning and funding issues increase cost of public project. The current road and Vanga from Vanga to Benapol via Joshore is a two-lane highway which the project is supposed to convert into four lanes connecting a ferry terminal at the Kalna point of Madhumoti river in Norail. <coughs> Most of the vehicles bound for Benapol, Joshor and Jinaida take this narrow road which cannot properly accommodate the extra traffic load creating huge bottlenecks. Despite its potential to ease traffic, the expansion project is still stuck at the planning level. Reportedly, the cost of the project 
has risen primarily because of lack of funding from India. It has been in talks since 2017. If funding uncertainties continue, the cost may rise even further, for which the public will have to pay again. This is totally unacceptable. Unfortunately, many government projects are suffering from similar problems and irregularities. At the RHD alone, only three of its projects are on track to be finished this year, while 41 are set to miss their 2022 deadline. As per a report, most of these projects have seen cost escalations indicating a pattern of willful negligence and corruption. Taking up projects without a proper feasibility study and cost estimation, slow tender process and dividing project work into small packages to benefit influential contractors are among the key reasons for project delays. These are issues that can be averted and huge amounts of public money saved. If project officials maintain their honesty and professionalism, instead these projects have become synonymous with corruption, inefficiency and irregularities. We therefore urge the higher authorities to take urgent steps to address this state of affairs, including often inflated project cost, which is much needed at this time of great economic turmoil in the country. As regards the RHD projects, it is of paramount importance that the department, the department grows capacity to plan and implement better, and it must do so with its existing projects as well. The RHD plays a key role in ensuring connectivity in the country. If it does its work properly, people can reach not only their destinations but also their potential as economic actors. For that reason, pending and planned projects like the Bhanga Joshur Benapol Road expansion work must be executed without further delay. Two few shelters for dom domestic violence victims. Why has the state failed to provide a safe space for them? We are utterly disappointed that the Domestic Violence uh, Act Prevention and Protection enacted 12 years ago has not had the desired impact due to a, a lack of proper enforcement and in the absence of necessary institutional support for victims. According to a report published in this daily, victims and survivors of domestic violence in the country can hardly access shelters, psychosocial counseling and medical services, let alone seek any legal redress for the crimes committed against them. In the absence of a proper support mechanism, a majority of the victims are being forced to live with their abusers. Reportedly, we currently have only around 36 shelters in the country, 15 of them run by NGOs for over 80 million women and over 60 million children. Most of these shelters are located in the metropolitan areas, which is difficult for women from uh, the grassroots level to access. In addition, the process of admission to a shelter is very complicated, as victims need police referrals, 
or court orders to get access to victim support centers or one-stop crisis centers being run by the state agencies. But, but most victims of domestic violence are unable to immediately file cases with police or go to courts. As a result, when women want to get out of an abusive relationship or want to leave their abusive in-laws houses, they often face the threat of homelessness more often than not. They are forced to stay back or keep enduring torture. Another factor that hinders women from seeking justice or getting out of an abusive relationship is the social stigma surrounding domestic violence and the age-old practice of regarding their psychological and physical abuses as one's personal matters that should not be talked about. A joint study by ActionAid Bangladesh and Jatiyo Nari Nirjatan Protirodh Forum in 2018 found that 72% of women who faced intimate partner violence never disclosed it to anyone. It is alarming that such a large number of women are being subjected to torture in their own homes and are denied their right to a safe and dignified life on a daily basis. The law has some very important provisions to support abused women and children including protection orders for women, right to reside in the marital home, temporary custody of children, and recovery of personal assets and assets acquired during the marriage. However, it is the state's responsibility to address the loopholes in its implementation and enforce the law effectively. To begin with, it must dramatically increase the number of shelters in partnership with NGOs if necessary, and build their capacity to provide survivors with the help and guidance they need, including psychosocial counseling and economic support. The process of accessing these services must also be made easier. We must provide the victims shelter first and ask questions later. It is over, finally. A peaceful BNP rally brings relief, but it will be short-lived without compromise from the ruling camp. We are quite relieved that BNP's rally at the Gulabbag playground in Saidabad, Dhaka has ended peacefully, with the party putting behind a dramatic build-up to the event to announce fresh programs as well as a 10-point demand to the ruling party. Any tension arising from the acrimonious circumstances prevailing over the last few days was largely contained, although a law and order approach to a political problem is itself a problem. We must acknowledge that finding common ground on the necessity of peace for however brief a uh, period is also an achievement. But peace or lack of violence in this case was not lack of suffering. As reported by the media, the ruling camps response to the rally putting the capital literally on hold caused great misery for ordinary commuters. There was no public bus available and obstruction to the movement of rickshaws. CNGs and private cars was reported in various areas. Many commuters both within the city and on roads leading to it reported being stopped and harassed on their way. The irony of the government's argument for not allowing the BNP rally at Noapolton to avoid disruption to public life was in 
escapable the same argument however was conveniently forgotten when ruling party leaders and activists occupied the streets and held rallies of their own there what this shows is how despite all the lip service to public interest those those mean little to the ruling party we must be apprehensive about the outcome of the bnp rally too which completed its months long program of the 10 divisional rallies in the country as was anticipated seven mps representing the party at parliament have announced their resignation saying they were barred from speaking time and again and hence there was no point in staying in parliament public interests were again overlooked for mps represent not just their party but their constitu constituents as well their mess resignation is an affront to the people who voted for them and trusted them to speak there on their behalf bnp still point demand including dissolution of parliament formation of a non-partisan caretaker government etc represents key points of contention between the opposition and the ruling establishment which are unlikely to be resolved anytime soon. From the look of things, the fire's residence, resistance to these demands will continue making peace more fragile. This is deeply alarming. However, despite the apparent futility and repetitive nature of everything that happened over the last week, we must acknowledge that the impressive showing at the BNP event uh, with a large number of supporters from around the country staying overnight to make it a success is a powerful statement by itself, which should not be lost on the powers that be. <laughs> <clears throat> lost on the powers that be the message that it sends is there are legitimate long simmering, simmering smearing grievances that cannot be ignored anymore if political parties could find common ground on peace we hope they can do the same on other <clears throat> priorities of the public including an end to their economic woes, respecting their inalienable uh, human rights and creating the ideal environment for free and fair elections. <coughs> Why is RHD hiring firms with poor, poor records? Important road development projects should not be in incompetent hands. Questionable contracts at RSD project. <clears throat> we are disappointed at the way the roads and highways department has been planning and implementing its road improvement projects across the country with a majority of them having to face time and cost overruns. <clears throat> Far from trying to rectify this <coughs> abysmal track record, the state-run agency has now decided to give the job of implementing a part of the Dhaka Silet Highway expansion project ataka 16918.59 crore 
undertaking to turn the 210 kilometer highway into a hour lane one <coughs> into a four lane one to uh, two contractors who reportedly also have a questionable record in project implementation <coughs> one of them Sino Hydro Engineering Bureau, 8 Corporation Limited, a subsidiary of Chinese firm Sino Hydro earned a bad name for its work on the Dhaka Chottogram Highway Expansion, while the other, Toma Construction and Company Limited, a local company, was accused of being reluctant or extremely slow in implementing several projects in the past now the first company is going to be awarded ataka 576.05 crore contract and the second along with a turkish company is going to be awarded ataka 896.81 crore contract these two are among the 13 contractors being assigned for the project. <coughs> the question is, why would the RHD authorities choose two companies with proven records of incompetence for this important work? While the director of the project claims that the tendering process is being conducted. Following the guideline of the Asian Development Bank, we think the government should investigate the authenticity of their claims as well as potential irregularities. Another question that we must ask is why have they decided to implement the project under six packages? Apparently, the tendency to divide project work in small packages eventually benefits the influential non-professional contractors. <coughs> Did the RHD think it through before making such a decision? One may recall that in 2018, the Anti-Corruption Commission had sent a letter to the Secretary of Cabinet Division with 21 recommendations to prevent institutional, institutional corruption in the roads and highways department. At the time, the SEC pointed out several irregularities in awarding tender and observed that some syndicates were choosing the contractors for the RSD projects. In its investigations, the SEC also found that a number of engineers and other officials of the RHD were building substandard roads to misappropriate public money. It revealed that these officials acted in collusion, collusion with politically influential persons and contractors to violate the terms of tender. We therefore urge the RHD authorities to remain cautious while selecting firms for its projects and ensure that uh, only competent firms with good track records get the contracts. This, however, is only one of the many problems that are plaguing the RHD projects right now. In order for this vital de department to implement all its projects on time and within fixed budgets, it needs to eliminate corruption, inefficiency and mismanagement and also make the reforms necessary going forward.